and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated, dedicated to ending corporate domination, establishing true democracy, and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Sherry uh, Shurkin, Shurkin. Uh, Executive Director of Friends of Family Farmers uh, and owner of Dancing Roots Farm, a 10-acre ecologically focused farm in Corbett, Oregon. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so tell me how you got involved with uh, Friends of Family Farmers. Well, I was um, first got involved when they uh, did the listening sessions in the Portland area, and that was something that the organization started, I think 2009 was the first set of listening sessions. They went around the state hearing from farmers, socially responsible farmers, and I went to one of those, and then I actually went, became a delegate to, um, uh, in Corvallis we had, uh, we put together, we had delegates from all over the state, and we went to um, get together and wrote up our Agricultural Reclamation Act, which is our call to the legislature, our Oregon legislature, these are the issues facing family scale, socially responsible farms. And we had a, we had a united voice with small farmers throughout this, small and mid-sized farmers throughout the state. And this was the document we put together, the Agricultural Reclamation Act. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a delegate to that. So I followed uh, Friends of Family Farmers for a number of years and would go every other year. We have rally day at the Capitol. So I went to that to say, family farmers mean business. That's our rally oh, and right. we're a, we exist, pay attention to us, hello. You know, the, um, and what I realized why I was so thankful for the work of Friends of Family Farmers and continued to stay involved, just as a volunteer, as a very busy farmer, is that um, the legislators in Salem, our representatives around the state, had only been hearing from uh, the Farm Bureau, basically, right. and the agribusiness lobby. Uh, we're just a bunch of hardworking, many independent farmers, you know, working 72 hours a day trying to make our uh, farms work, farms and ranches work, and we had no voice in Salem. And when I realized that that's what Friends of Family Farmers was, I just continued to get more involved, and eventually I got on the board of directors, and so I have been on the board for the last six and a half years. Uh -huh. And that sort of segued into now being the executive director. Uh -huh. So it's been a really great um, succession for me. I uh, really want to put in a plug for doing volunteer work for uh, any organization that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, you never know what's going to lead you. Yeah. So here I am, the new uh, executive director. I was interim, but I recently became the, the for real, the permanent or the, yeah. the regular uh -huh. one. But um, I am so excited about the work that we do and can do, and the potential to do good for the earth, to do good for our health, to do good for rural economies, for bridging the gap, the urban-rural divide. There's so much that we could continue to do that I'm, I'm like gung-ho to yeah. move this organization right. forward. But yeah. a, a, a keystone, a key element of what we do is be a voice in the, legislator, in the legislature so that our voices are heard. Mm -hmm. um, we have one little lobbyist uh, representative speaking on behalf of sustainable, small, mid-sized, truly independent family farms, and there's about 10 or 11 voices representing agribusiness, mm -hmm. and so okay. it, it's just us. So. Yeah, right, yeah. So when you say agribusiness, you're talking about the large corporate sector? The um, corporate sector, the um, the cor corporate agriculture really has kind of a stronghold in Oregon, and so that's we're it's like the David and Goliath, and so we have, um, you know, for example, the the truth is that Monsanto, which is not based here, greatly largely funds our local Oregon Oregon Farm Bureau, and wow. so um, and so they are throwing money at they um, use their money to elect people who support more corporate agriculture. They elect, um, they affect our policies and make it harder for small farmers like us to exist. So we, we're just, we have a mountain to climb as, a, as a wearing my small farmer hat, we yeah. have a mountain to climb to be truly financially sustainable and viable. And it's because the corporate ag, ha, ha, corporate agriculture has so many benefits. They've, they've, they've got it easy and we don't, and so 
this is why we need to have a voice so we can yeah. do things like one of our successes in the last 10 years at Friends of Family Farmers is we're helping, we helped get the, um, the cottage industry bill passed so that we can, as a small farmer, I grow these tomatoes, but we can also make some tomato, we can make tomato products and low risk things. We could do it in our own kitchens and be able to sell them at a farmer's market. That was a huge effort just so that we could. Oh, that's amazing. I, yeah. would, I would just think that that would be a given that no, you'd be able to. No, oh, we okay. had to ha have, a, we had to put a lot of resources and, and people from different sectors make it so that the legislature would pass a law that says that we could do this thing, but only certain things, not anything, but certain things. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of work that we do. We worked really hard to pass the farm to school bill so we can, so schools can have a little bit additional money so that they can support local growers, local farmers in their area to get good local school food in, in our schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, in reading some of the materials, it looked like there was a big question mark in this last legislative yeah, session about whether down that to the would wire. continue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. luckily we got that funded and so that, that will be a real help to to small farmers and oh, right. make and, it and, more and feasible. And to uh, a lot of school kids. <laughs> and the school kids, yeah. Right. Make it more feasible so for school districts to be able to do the extra work and the, take the extra step of working directly with local farmers. Right now they can make one phone call and order everything, but now they can now they can have incentive to support a local farmer that could be right in their region. Oh, right, right, okay, yeah. Who might be just a little bit smaller and otherwise couldn't. Uh, yeah, and you're worried about doing the farming mm -hmm. uh, and not so much about doing the outreach and now you have uh, an easier time of doing that. Right, and right. now we have an organization that is batting for us and right, advocating right. for us, and uh -huh. that's what we do. We advocate and promote socially responsible agriculture. Okay, which was uh, actually going to be my beginning oh. question. <laughs> no, we, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so the, the purpose the purpose of Friends of Farm, Family Farmers, you know, talk about just a little bit about the origins, how, how long ago, and was there a particular event that uh, caused them to form? Or? We, we started in, t in 2005 when the first uh, mega dairy came into Oregon. We realized that um, we had been, um, I don't know if spoiled is the right word, but we had been lucky that we did not have any mega dairies in the state. We didn't have any of the confined animal feeding operations or concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs as they're known. Mm -hmm. And when the first one came in, we thought, wow, this is a, this is a problem. This is, not, this is not good. Generally, the industrial scale agricultural operations do not benefit family farmers. They do not benefit local communities. And they don't even benefit the state because they're at, they're out of state corporations, and the money just goes out of the state. Yeah. So, and they often pollute, and then they ha have ways to get around all kinds of rules and regulations. So, they really don't benefit us at all, and they don't benefit the animals. They don't benefit us humans. So, so by 2007, we were incorporated into a nonprofit organization, and then we have been um, working to promote socially responsible agriculture. And another aspect about the organization that I love that really is great for anyone thinking about getting involved is that in, um, while we oppose corp, uh, industrial agriculture for those reasons that I mentioned, they're not good for the earth, they're not good for the animals, our organization is for good agriculture. So we're an organization that's really focused on advocating for and promoting socially responsible, environmentally responsible agriculture. Mm -hmm. So we're we're kind of on the other side being for, we have a, a program, one of our active programs right now is the Oregon Pasture Network. And we are, we just put together the first statewide guide of um, pastured producers throughout the state. So when it comes time to think about buying your meat or your milk or your eggs, you can go onto our website and find out where to get these in wherever you are in Oregon. And we're, we're just building our network. It's, it's starting small, but this is what we're working on to support those farmers that are doing it right, raising their animals on pasture, mm -hmm. which we believe is the right way to do it. It's, uh, it's the right way for the, for the animals, and it's really the right way for us also. Well, when the they, animals are happy, they're... they're they produce they're, happy milk. Yeah, <laughs> happy milk, happy animals, yeah. So, um, and maybe it's going to be a little bit more expensive, mm -hmm. and maybe you could eat a little bit less, but the point is that you are eating in a way that reflects your values, mm -hmm. that when you're shopping, you're shopping in a way that reflects your values, so that, I mean, most of us eat two, three times a day, so we have lots of opportunities every day to um, make a difference, mm -hmm. actually, to really actually make a difference and support local growers that are 
doing that are growing in a way that is reflective of your values. You're right, yeah. So t talk a little bit uh, about community supported agriculture, CSAs. Okay. Uh, are, is your farm a CSA? We did for 18 years, uh -huh. but we're okay. not doing that okay. anymore. Talk a little bit about what that is. And so the idea is that, you know, farmers have the unique um, challenge that we are, we're utterly dependent on mother nature. So just like we have all the same challenges as, as pretty much every other business, you know, payroll and regulations and um, inventory and hiring and you know, all that. And then we have Mother Nature on top of it. And, and our agriculture over the year, over the last 50 years in this country, the farmer took all the responsibility or took all the risk and whether it was a super good year, so if you had a big bounty of it, you, you had to deal with the bounty, or if you lost your crop, you had to deal with that. So we do now have crop insurance for some farmers, mostly monocrop farms. Um, there is very recently a new national program to provide crop insurance for diverse farmers, like us who grow 100 different things or 50 different things. Um, but the farmer took all the responsibility all on their own. They, ha they dealt with the risk, they dealt with the bounty, and. And so the idea of CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, is that the risks and the bounty is shared with the eaters. Uh -huh. And so that's, sort of, that's how the idea started out. And it started on the East Coast, and then some West Coast farmers heard about, the, uh, about 35 years ago on the East Coast, and West Coast farmers heard about it and said, that's a great idea, I'd love to have a specific community that I'm growing for. Mm -hmm. So the um, East Coast CSA models were uh, consumer initiated more initially. I'm talking 35 years ago when it first started in this okay. country. Uh -huh. Whereas on the West Coast, it's always been more farmer driven. The farmers have said, hey, I'm going to do the CSA thing. I will grow all your vegetables for you and provide eggs and or milk and or cheese and or uh, meat products and or flowers and or, you know, so we would add uh, honey. So we'd add other things on there. Um, so it's a great model of a true partnership between the eater and the grower. Okay. And All that's right. the idea of community-supported agriculture. It's where you have a direct relationship with your farmer. Okay. And, and the finance. Talk about the financial. Uh, how how does the financing work? Because I, I know for farmers, you have the upfront cost mm -hmm. at the beginning of the season mm -hmm. of buying the seed and the fertilizer and right. all that stuff. Right. But you don't have any money. Well, hopefully you have some money in the uh, bank from the some. year before, but right, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but it, it's, it's yeah. That's a, it's, where your big expenses are right, at the yeah. beginning of the year for yeah. sure. So CSAs help you with that. They do now. There, there's many different models of CSA as there are individuals, uh, but okay. um, many CSAs, you you pay the whole season up front to give that farmer that money. There we go. Our CSA actually, we never did that. Oh. We took about a fifty percent. A deposit or a one-third deposit and many farms started to do that after because that that's a big chunk of change that a lot of people don't have yeah, themselves mm -hmm. and we want to be accessible to a lot of different people so we would um, we and I know many other farmers uh, some uh, even take snap now which is great to um, they can take uh, what used to be called food food stamps oh, yeah. okay. so there's ways you can do that there's snap matching programs now so CSA has really come of age and many but there and there's even new um, apps, what do you call it? computer yeah. Uh, yeah. apps, uh, apps yeah. things, right, yeah. where you can, um, and they'll handle even the bookkeeping part of it. So if a farmer signs up with this um, app, then their customers can go in online and just pay monthly uh, or something like okay. that. So, um, and it's true that uh, there are a lot of upfront costs like seed and fertilizer. However, you, you, I used to say, we, we like cash flow, you know, we still need money in the middle of the season and near the end of the season yeah. too, because we're still paying our crew. Year oh, round. Sure. We're still paying mm -hmm. water bills year round and we're still paying our crew to wind up the tea tape at the end of the year and take the stakes out and put things away. So, I mean, you, you still have needs. It's not like you have only your expenses up front. Yeah, so. right. okay. But the CSA is a great model. There are There's probably over 100 now in the Portland area and there's the Portland Area CSA Coalition and there's Local Harvest, which is a national organization. So it's, uh -huh. it's a yeah. great... So the CS, CSA Co Association would be the best way for people to get connected into Locally the program? Locally in Portland in would Portland. be portlandcsa.org okay um, but that would be for the portland area nationally probably the best would be localharvest.org and you can find your local csa um, through through that website that's a national uh -huh. search 
Okay, okay, this is valuable information. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned CSA because what I what I learned as a being a farmer for the last 20 years is that I, I just really believe that if you want to make a difference, if you want to um, put your money where your mouth is, uh, supporting a local grower is really one of the really one of the best ways you can do it every day. We all eat two to three times a day. Um, and supporting your local farmers and ranchers is, it has so many uh, good, um, I want to say manifestations, I can't think of the word. There's so many ripple effects mm -hmm. of so keeping your money in the local economy, eating very fresh, healthy food. These tomatoes are picked at their peak. They're picked when they're ripe and you have to be gentle with them. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like tomatoes, we don't pick them green, oh, yeah. you know. So everything about keeping money in the local economy and having some relationship with a local farmer, CSA is a great way to do it. There's also just shopping at a local farmer's market. There's shopping at stores that buy from local markets. There's many markets in the Portland area that buy directly from local growers. There's um, going, if you're going to a restaurant, asking the waiter, waitress or the chef, you know, are you buying from local growers? There's, there's a lot of food here being moved, moved yeah. around uh -huh. that have to do with local growers. So it's, you don't even have to be directly buying from a local farmer, although that, that's a great way to do it, but just some way that you're being aware that the food you're eating grew here in Oregon. I mean, we really have a challenge. I think about 85% of the food we grow here is leaves the state, and I hear we, we yeah. import like 80% mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. food, when we could be growing so much of our food. I was just reading about an organization in Eastern Oregon, the Northeast Economic Development, I, I'm leaving a word out, but um, a big thing of theirs is like, we should be growing more of our food, and, and here, and here, all over the state, all over the country, you hear people are saying, we should be growing more of our food. We've got food traveling all over the globe, and food grown here, shit there, because of this economy of scale, supposedly, that's, yeah. that's making a better deal. Well, that's, that's, that's primarily an argument from corporate agriculture. It, it is, you know, one time I heard this thing that we, um, we import, we export butter to um, Denmark, I guess, mm -hmm. and we import uh, Danish butter cookies. And yes. I, someone said, wouldn't it be easier Couldn't if we, we just, just sent them the recipe? <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, it's right. like, there's just food traveling all over. I mean, I heard the average food travels like 4,000 miles or something. Mm -hmm. And here we're in the Pacific Northwest, we can grow year round here. Yes. And many places can grow a lot longer than they do. And, you know, sometimes you think about it, it's like, well, who's benefiting from this system where food is just traveling all over. Yeah, yeah, and that food traveling all over has a, has a, a um, is detrimental to the environment. It you know, is. Which we're all concerned with. That's but right. But we don't think about it. You know, am I going to get my food from 20 miles away or 2,000 miles away? Well, the, exactly. the, the, the cost of getting that from 2,000 miles away is much greater environmentally. Yeah, and that's locally. the thing. Our industrial agriculture system, which is really only since like the mid to late 40s or 50s, um, somewhere around that time where we really started to go industrial, is heavily fossil fuel based. And that trucking yes. and the shipping of it all over is, is one aspect. Um, and it's just not sustainable. Yeah, right, right, yeah. So, so what, what do you what, what do you grow on your home farm? We grow tomatoes and winter squashes. Oh, I could have brought some of my delicata yeah. squash and um, um, pepper, sweet and hot peppers. Um, uh, a lot of different herbs, fresh basil. Um, we grow lettuces and salad mix. And yeah, we're we're kind of shifting our farm. We're shifting the focus of our farm. We were growing a little bit of a lot of different things, which is what you need to do for the CSA. And we're kind of shifting that to growing a lot of a few things. And so we're shifting our market and kind of moving more, a little bit more towards wholesale. Okay. So it's a whole shift for our farm personally. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. and uh, you sell direct to restaurant mm -hmm. owners mm -hmm. and so forth, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. And, and in the Portland area. In the Portland area, right. okay. just in the Portland area. Right. And, and um, that sort of takes me back to um, Friends of Family Farmers. Um, one of the things we're dealing with is our State Department of Agriculture, ODA, has been do, putting in a huge amount of effort to um, support all Oregon farmers, because that's what they're supposed to do, 
but a lot of Oregon farmers export. And so, and, and you know, I'm talking a long-term transition. I, you know, we, I have friends who grow food that gets exported. We export a lot of our wheat, we export our blueberries, we export our grain. So we, we're, you know, I'm certainly not saying we, we should shut down these export operations. Yeah, yeah, That's not right. gonna happen. That's not gonna happen at all. We, we don't want that to happen. What we want to happen is to see if we can't transition ourselves so that we are growing more of our own food. Mm -hmm. that, and it's a, it's a long, long process. And I think at some point we're going to have to look and say, what is environmentally feasible and reasonable given that our fossil fuel dependence is causing a lot of problems mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, All right, yeah. And, and, and we uh, just assume that these complex systems that have been set up, that are mostly corporate, are going to last forever, and that, um, that we don't need to think and worry about where our food comes from. But in fact, we know that things don't last forever. Yeah. And at some point, being able to produce things uh, uh, locally and eat things that are produced locally is going to have a huge benefit for us. I I believe so. Um, and, it, and it was really a relatively short amount of time that we all expect that we should be able to go to a store almost any time, 24-7, <laughs> and get a tomato or a banana or oranges or coffee or whatever we want at any time we want it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the big shift is going to need to happen is in our own minds and in our own habits um, where we have, m there's a million, you could go online and there's a million recipes for anything, right? Yeah. Let's say you mm -hmm. think, I want to make this for dinner. That sounds really good. And you go online and you get the recipes and you go to the store and you go get those ingredients. Well, it could be the middle of winter and it could be really, base it, it could be required that you need uh, fresh tomatoes or fresh basil or something like that and you could go to a store and you could find those things but where did they come from yes um, and so a big part of the shift is what's in season and what can i get locally and luckily in the portland area we have year-round farmers markets mm -hmm. and um, we have chefs i work with some of them what and they shift their menus in the winter so that they're based on what is seasonally. We have sea, we have seasonal seafood. We have some some things you can do year round. Some things you can do year uh, round. You can grow kale almost year round. You could grow chard or some herbs can grow year round, especially if you have a, a greenhouse. So there's ways of going about it. It's not like going back to caveman days, but yeah, there are right. there are ways that we can make our shift to say what's really in season. Mm -hmm. And I used to say when I ran the CSA. Um, um, CSA works doesn't work for everybody but the people it works for it works really well and some of the people that it works well for are those who open up their refrigerator and they say okay what's in my refrigerator now what oh, yeah. did I just get from my, in my box in mm -hmm. my basket this last week mm -hmm. from my farmer or who go to a farmers market and say what do you got and they base their meals on that yeah. rather than the other way around mm -hmm. right. so the idea is to say what's in season this is what I'm gonna. This is what I'm gonna make for dinner. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and just just for myself, just uh -huh. talking personally, I, I have I have for my little little plot of land uh -huh. where my house is uh, in northeast Portland. I, I have a reasonable sized garden, and I've never planted for winter. Oh. And this year I've started planting for winter vegetables. There you go. Right. Yeah. So we'll see how that works out. But oh, I'm very excited about it actually. <laughs> oh yeah, and there's things that you can plant now. Well, we already should have planted like in August that will overwinter and then you'll have it in April. You oh, can yes. have a head of cauliflower in April mm -hmm. that overwintered. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so, yeah, so exciting stuff. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of resources out there for you for okay. uh, how, to, how to do winter growing in oh, well, year-round gardens. Okay, so. well, we'll talk a little more after all the right. show. <laughs> all right, there you go. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, like kale, kale's one thing that um, I know it's really popular, but personally, I just don't even like it in the summer. I don't like the way it tastes, no matter, even if, wherever it's from, I just don't love kale in the summer. But in the winter, it's my favorite vegetable. Hmm. So it's so good, and, and I've learned that um, it's kind of sweet. And I've learned that the thing that makes it cold tolerant is, uh, is a, um, a, a anth the anthocyanins in it or something. They, they actually make it so the thing that makes it cold tolerant is also what makes it taste really sweet. Oh, yeah. So it's a good, super healthy green 
but I only like it in the winter. So, yeah, that's and I don't think I'm being right. too picky. I, I like it when it's really good. Yeah, <laughs> so. right. Absolutely. That's actually, when we all like things, is when it's really good. It's when they're really good. Yeah, if it's not, we don't want to eat right, it. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. great. Uh, anything else that uh, we should know about Friends of Family Farmers? How do people get involved with Friends of Family Farmers? What might they do? Great. That's a great question. Um, we have. Um, a number of different volunteer opportunities. Let me just say there are two, we have a couple programs that we work on. We have our farmer campaign, we do things for farmers, and then we have our eater campaign. And what we realized is that this, this kind of work here, um, talking to you and letting people know, um, you know, I, I was at a, a, a farming conference a number of years ago and Vandana Shiva was there, who's a total oh, hero wonderful. of mine. And mm -hmm. she used the phrase, I'm not sure if she coined it or not, but that all of us, all of us who eat, are co-producers because all of us as a community, as a city, as a state, our eating, our eating behaviors, our food choices are what's going to, it's, um, it's going to set the tone for what our farmers are going to grow. So mm -hmm. that's the idea and that's especially you know relevant with a CSA or when you shop at a farmer's market when you support directly your local farmer. Um, the, the idea that all of us eaters, we have a lot to say about the policies and, um, and the state of agriculture in our state just by our choices. Mm -hmm. And um, I know it's really easy to go to Costco or Walmart and all that stuff, but uh, it, it might take a little bit more effort on the eater's part. And so part of what we try to do is to educate people and let them know how, how much they're actions, their purchasing uh -huh. um, um, behaviors affect local agriculture. Right, yeah. okay. so, um, so I'm sorry, our time uh, is okay. up, so oh. thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Sherry. All right. Oh, that went so quick. It does. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So we've been talking with Sherry uh, Sirkin, uh, Executive Director of Friends of Family Farmers and owner of Dancing Roots Farm, a 10-acre ecologically focused uh, farm in Corbett, Oregon. More information about the organization is available on their website at www.friendsoffamilyfarmers.org. Have you missed one of our programs? Want to watch something again or suggest it to a friend? Well, you can do that now as all of our Populous Dialogues programs are, are saved on our webpage. Visit populousdialogues.org to view past programs or to, to uh, sign up for a YouTube uh, channel notification when a new program is uh, added. So thank you for watching and we'll see you again next week. Bye.